Televised presidential debates have been an American political tradition for the past 60 years. But while they're far from perfect, they're still beneficial to voters as a means to learn about a candidate. That was locker room talk. What's more, they can make or break an election. So what, if anything, can be done to improve them? The candidates need no introduction. It's telling that the first ever televised presidential debate in 1960 between candidates Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy remains famous not for what was said, but for how each candidate looked. Senator Kennedy has Although Nixon and Kennedy talked extensively about the big issues of the time, like the Cold War and civil rights, what is best remembered today is each candidate's appearance. You know, the Nixon-Kennedy debates in 1960 were actually the beginning of the modern televised debate era. There was actually four debates in 1960, but what everybody remembers is the first debate where Kennedy looked healthy and Nixon looked sweaty and sick. He paid a price for that, and what people remembered was how they looked, not what they said. For better or worse, the Kennedy-Nixon matchup set a precedent of style over substance that's only grown more prevalent in televised debates. What tends to be remembered from debates are moments, and usually they're moments of gaffes or mistakes, not high moments or, or great moments. That was the case with the next debate in 1976, when President Gerald Ford faced off against his Democratic challenger, Jimmy Carter. What Ford said really wasn't a gaffe, it just sort of came out uh, uh, not the way he intended it to be. There is no Soviet domination of Eastern Europe, and there never will be under a Ford administration. What he said essentially was that the people of Poland don't consider themselves to be subjugated to Soviet rule. And that was true. The way it came across and the way it was portrayed, unfortunately for him, was that he was naive. He thought the Polish people weren't really under the Soviet thumb, when in fact, of course, in those days they were. That's again what everybody remembered from that debate, and it didn't help him. You already are the oldest president in history. Poignant moments in a debate can also help a candidate. In 1984, Ronald Reagan famously put questions about his age to bed with this quip. I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. In the first debate, Reagan didn't look all that good. He looked a little old. He was stumbling around a bit. That produced some stories, including, ironically, a famous one on the front page of the Wall Street Journal that said, the age factor has arisen. So the Reagan campaign knew going into that debate they had an age issue to deal with. It did diffuse the age uh, question for the rest of that campaign. Modern debates also have the added pressure of going viral. Sometimes debate moments that don't go well can be not just bad, they can be almost fatal. It's three agencies of government when I get there that are gone. Commerce, education, and the, um, uh, what's the third one there? Let's see. <laughs> that was the case for Rick Perry in 2011 when he got halfway into a debate answer and then couldn't remember the rest of it. The third one I can't, sorry. <laughs> Oops. Or Mitt Romney's famous slip up in 2012. I went to a number of women's groups and said, can you help us find folks? And they brought us whole binders full of, uh, of women. He was trying to say that I have paid attention to adm advancing women in my career. I have a record of doing it, but it came across badly. It came across in a way that made it look as if women were nothing but sheets of paper in a binder to him. Clearly debates can have an effect on the outcome of an election, but what can be done to improve them? I think it's crucial when you're analyzing debates to distinguish between primary season debates and general election debates. They're two quite different animals, and I think, in my opinion, one works way better than the other. Primary debates tend to be free-for-alls, where there's no particular format or formula from one debate to the next. They tend to be sponsored by media organizations, sometimes by state parties, uh, sometimes by combinations of all of the above. In contrast, the general election debates are a bit more sober and controlled. General election debates are conducted with the Commission on Presidential Debates, which was established in 1987, which has done this through eight presidential cycles, and which knows how to do it right and in a distinguished way. One proposal is to remove live studio audiences. And from the Wall Street Journal, Jerry side. Well, first of all, I've done three debates with live audiences who are partisans, and so I know what the atmosphere is like, and it could be problematic it is basically becomes a campaign rally to some extent, and I don't think it's the ideal way to hold a presidential debate. Hell yes, we're gonna take your AR-15, your AK-47. A smaller audience that is not filled with campaign partisans um, is a better way to go.
Another, at least for the primaries, is to reduce the number of candidates on stage. A debate with too many candidates is very unwieldy. It's hard to conduct a meaningful, substantive conversation that follows a logical progression. We don't have time for tone. The biggest question hanging over the 2020 debates is the issue of President Donald Trump's participation. What President Trump has said is that he thinks the debate commission was unfair to him in 2016 and he's not sure he's going to agree to do the three presidential debates that they have set up. I think that would be a mistake. I think it would be bad for the country, bad for the campaign, bad for democracy. It's easy to be critical of debates because they can be very messy and they're not always perfect. But when I think about debates, I think a little bit about what Winston Churchill said about democracy. He said, democracy is the worst form of government except every other form of government that anybody's ever tried. They can be messy, they're not perfect, but they're a better way to get the candidates to address voters and address each other and address issues than anything else I can think of.